Welcome back, traders and investors, to Benzinga's Pre-Market Prep, brought to you by Marketify. We have a special guest on the line, and that's Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's Chief Investment Officer at Lemelson Capital Management, one of the top hedge fund managers in the world. Reverend, how are you doing today? Great, Joel. How are you? Good. Thanks for coming on. Uh, real quickly here, this is touch on Apple earnings out today. You have been a perma Apple bull. How are you playing it? <laughs> how are you playing it today? It just to you is this just another day? It's just another stock? It's just another watch? Or do you like to do different things ahead of earnings? Well, yeah, you know, Joel, chances are they're going to, you know, break all the estimates. I wouldn't be surprised if they hit 60 million iPhone unit sales. Um, probably iPad will continue to decline. But I think the risk for anyone contemplating Apple is to think a little bit more long term and, and get away from just looking at quarterly uh, reports. Some of the bigger issues people might want to think about are, um, you know, what Apple will do with their capital return program. Chances are they'll increase the dividend. Uh, hopefully they'll increase their share buybacks. And those share buybacks have a huge impact on EPS going forward. And also, it, it's really a free uh, increase in pro ownership in the issue. So, uh, you know, there's that. There's also some more subtle things that people don't talk about as much with Apple. I mean, when we look at Apple as a platform, they're really the only major technology company that controls both their hardware and their software. And they're also um, one of the only uh, technology companies who have really a robust desktop and mobile business. And when we think about that, I mean, that's important because uh, as their, their base of users grow and it snowballs, uh, I think this is increasing discord people feel at work, and that gives rise to a tremendous opportunity and enterprise for Apple. So, you know, if you look at Google, they have a really large presence in mobile, uh, not really in desktop, never really took off. And then it's the opposite for Microsoft. They really controlled the desktop, never were able to make solid inroads in mobile. So here's Apple that really controls all those things. And, you know, it's, it, it looks really promising for the enterprise. So when people think about the economies of scale and say, maybe Apple can't grow any further, just look at the enterprise. I mean, a huge market opportunity there. Um, and I think also that, uh, you know, you look at what's going on with Apple Watch, it's hard not to say that they're, you know, not going to dominate that category, this nascent wearables category. So, uh, you know, it looks really, really promising for the long run. It's a, it's a huge, really well-run company. Uh, it's, it's paying its shareholders. Um, although there'll probably be estimates for the quarterly, I would say if you're long Apple, even look at the larger issues for the long run, where are they going to be in a couple of years with the, the enterprises and opportunity, be my thought. Yeah, you met, uh, made an interesting point there about still, you know, controlling their hardware and software because uh, article in the New York Times over the weekend was comparing the market cap of Apple to IBM back in 85. And IBM kind of let Microsoft and Intel, you know, in on some of their turf and that kind of hurt them in the long run. But it's an interesting point that they, you know, they're still really in control of their own destiny. Uh, let's move on to another stock that, you're getting some uh, favorable results now, but when you started following it, uh, it kind of got caught up in the oil vacuum here. And you know I'm talking about <laughs> geospace yeah. technologies here. You gave it the old uh, uh, both grandmothers. The first uh, I can't remember the first stock you said about uh, mortgaging your grandmother's <laughs> house, but this one, yeah. mortgaging your grand. When you say to mortgage all your relatives' house, that's when I'm going in big time. <laughs> but, uh, but let's talk about geospace technologies coming back with the oil market here, taking a little breather at 22. Give us your take on that. Well, it's a small cap. Um, it's been very volatile. The price really tanked. I mean, it was probably the cheapest you could have bought it almost in its entire history uh, just last month. And um, it's a great company, though, really solid management team. They're true engineers. Uh, they make these products that are for seismic exploration. And seismic is still the leading technology not just for exploration for new reserves, but also the judicious management of existing reserves. And I think that's where you need to sort of pay attention with geospace. Um, and that is that large oil makers like Statoil or BP or Shell or something like that, when they have existing reserves, um, they need to manage the, the flow of oil from those reserves. And, and these PRM systems, these permanent well monitoring systems, so these are systems that they install to permanently monitor uh, where oil is versus water and other things underground. Um, they're really important and and this is going to continue for the foreseeable future. Our thesis has been all along that irrespective of the price of oil, um, E&P will have to continue at some point. And, and we think it's just a matter of time for geospace. So, you know, if you're really enterprising and value-oriented, um, this would be the sort of thing you'd want to look for. And, uh, you know, last time geospace, their price collapsed during the financial crisis. 
uh, from the trough to the peak, I mean, it went up 20x in a matter of just a couple of years. Uh, I'm not saying that's going to happen again in this case, but it's not hard to imagine that a company that was just recently selling from below tangible assets, about more than 10% below tangible net current assets, actually. Uh, and there's actually nothing wrong with the company. It's just part of the, an industry-wide downturn and a pretty severe one at that. You know, that looks like a great opportunity for an enterprising investor. And it's gone up about 20%, I think, since we spoke last time. <laughs> and it's still very, very cheap. I mean, we're still buyers of the, the shares. We, we own close to 5% of the company. And we'll probably keep buying it. So, you know, I, I think going into 2015, Joel, it looks pretty reasonable to be short, <clears throat> you know, things like small biotech and, and long oil and gas. That, that sounds very reasonable to me for 2015. Do you have... You for, mentioned some shorts there. Do you, you got some? You mentioned some biotech shorts. I know Legan. That was uh, one from last year. Is there any uh, any new ones in the radar? Are you still doing some research? Well, there's a lot of there's probably a lot of monsters that you could easily short, but we try to stick with things we know. And we just happen to know a lot about Legan Pharmaceuticals because we wrote all these reports last year. We started shorting it again around seventy six and a half. It, it keeps going up. It's just an amazing thing, and we keep shorting it actually. So. Our average price we short at is 82 now. Uh, we'll probably keep shorting it as it goes up. It's a company that only has 18 employees. doesn't really do any real clinical trials per se. We don't think any of the indications they're developing have any real long-term value. We don't think the company as a whole has any intrinsic value. Um, it, in our opinion, it looks more like an operation designed to trans- transfer equity from common shareholders to management through stock awards. And that's something that cannot last in perpetuity. So... <clears throat> Uh, you know, we feel very comfortable being short stocks like that because we think, frankly, they're part of a bubble. And, and the market sort of picked up on that last year, but it, that's out of the mindset of the market. And, but it looks very dangerous. I mean, if you were long, small biotechs, uh, you know, I don't know how you sleep at night, frankly. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> uh, moving on here, WWE. I mean, you have uh, – we, we, we got started our relationship. I wrote an article on that, and – you nailed it on the long short side. You nailed it on the long side here. Now I know you're long one share here. Earnings coming out here. What are you thinking about WWE? Uh, that's a great question. So actually, there was a Barron's article this week. I that saw we it. I it. I saw uh, it. Talking about WWE. Oh, you did? Yeah, oh, of course. fantastic. Well, you know, the thing with WWE is that Vince McMahon deserves a lot of credit for seeing sort of the future of OTT. I mean... It is the future, and he jumped out ahead of it. But maybe he jumped too quickly and probably wasn't the right match for the underlying culture of his company, which really was making a foray into technology and a paradigm shift that probably alienated their partners. And really what's going on right now, I mean, all eyes are on the OTT network because they, they were not able to renegotiate the contracts with their uh, traditional uh, content syndication partners as a result of watching this competitive service. And so everyone's watching this. What are the, the subscriber numbers? They still have under a million paying subscribers. That's not enough to break even. And more importantly, I mean, it's difficult to parse through these releases when we talk about uh, OTT subs. Um, it's very unclear how they do it, but the bottom line is this. Um, last year, for example, if you just want to take a quick look at a few numbers, first of all, their, their growth is almost entirely coming from international at this point. For example, in Q3 of last year, um, you know, they had about 31,000 new subs. Uh, only 3,000 came from the U.S., 28,000 international. Same thing the following quarter. The vast majority came from the launch of their UK, uh, the, UK, the network in the U.K., and now if you look what's going on, um, in Q3 of last year, they had about 731,000 subscribers. By year end, they had only 816. But more importantly, they added 336,000 in the first quarter. But if you add Q3 and Q4 ads to that number, it's a million sixty-seven a year end. But we know they only had 816. That means that they actually lost 251,000 paying subscribers. And what they did effectively in that time is they added 242,000 new ones for free. So in November and February, and now just recently again in March, they've had three free promotions in advance of WrestleMania. That's three out of five months. And then they have this, this huge uptick in subscribers. It was like 59% month over month. So it looks impressive on the surface. It's 1.3 million subscribers, but they're not all paying by any means. So, you know, I think if you look at the period of time where there were uh, really no free promotions or WrestleMania, which was, you know, the two quarters last year prior to the fall, they were only adding like 300 new subscribers a day. So, you know, I'm pretty pessimistic on it, to tell you the truth. I think it's a brilliant idea. Vincent Van deserves a lot of credit for that, but it doesn't look good for the OTT network, and I think that it's a huge source of cost that's draining a company that is already performing very badly financially. And I think it's important not to confuse the fervor of the fans and their feelings about the brand for wise fiscal management, which the company needs very badly, but increasingly is probably out of reach because 
uh, corporate governance issues. So the company's recent changes to the board of directors uh, make it very difficult to bring in any new DNA into the company or any sort of different leadership. And then you've got a controlling class of shares that really sends a message to the common shareholder that, you know, we'd be very interested in your capital, but we really don't want your vote or your, your say in any way in the management of the company. So what do you do with a situation like that if you're a common shareholder? Um, probably something to stay away from. It's recovered a little bit in the price. I mean, it's, we, we sold our shares, all but one share in, in February, at around sixteen fifty two a share. It, it basically collapsed after that <clears throat> at the end of March. It's recovered a little bit now, but honestly, if you have to be on one side of the trade, it's probably safer to be on the short side. Can I ask you a non-stock topic question? Absolutely. Uh, what do you think of the Pacquiao Mayweather fight? <laughs> I'd love to watch that. I, I love boxing. I have to tell you, those guys are amazing athletes. Um, yeah, so I, you think I, you think Vegas is setting up three fights, or is it just going to have one quick one knockout uh, by Mayweather at Pacquiao? We'll, we'll see. You know, I, I don't know. I don't follow boxing closely enough to know. But you know what I do think, Joel? What I think Mayweather needs a good financial advisor. He's spending way too much money on depreciable assets <laughs> like cars, from what I understand. <laughs> Okay, that's and, great. All right, I, 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 I agree with that's that. That's what I think. That's great. Okay, we've been on the line with uh, Reverend Emmanuel Lemelson. He's chef and chief investment officer at Lemelson Capital Management, a long-term investor focusing on the fundamentals. Thanks a lot, Reverend. We'll talk to you again soon. So nice to be with both of you guys. Have a great day.